Good day to you brothers and sisters. Welcome back. I'm going to show you something cool as always. This is going to be lesson number six in the series I'm doing entitled uh, Raptured uh, from the Curse, the Seventh Bold Judgment. Uh, this is a real important series. I love doing this. Here are the type of questions of yours that will be answered and are being answered in this series of lessons. Uh, when is the return of Christ? When is the rapture? What is Judgment Day? Why is God doing it? When is Judgment Day? What's the wrath of the Lamb and how does it differ from the wrath of God and the wrath of Him who sits on the throne? Uh, can we know the day or the hour? If we can, when will we know the day or the hour? All of these questions are being answered in this series, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is, as I said, lesson number six. I've already done, let's see, Revelation 16. I went to those five verses in Revelation 16 that describe the seventh bowl. Not a whole lot there. Uh, you got to look at all the other places in the Bible that refer to the seventh bowl judgment day. They're all over God's word. That's why Father didn't give us a whole lot of information in Revelation 16 about the seventh bowl because he did it throughout the entire Bible. That's what we're learning in this series. Um, the curse that we are raptured from. Again, the seventh bowl is the rapture of the family of God. And you may say, well then what are we being raptured from? And brothers and sisters, we're being raptured from the refiner's fire, the wrath of the lamb, the plague of the furnace of fire, the plague of the fur the curse of the fiery furnace. I mean, all of this is judgment day. All right? The wrath of the lamb is the climax of the wrath of God, or the wrath of him who sits on the throne. Well, we're not appointed to wrath. That's correct. The wrath of the lamb, the curse of the refiner's fire. The plague of the fiery furnace, the furnace of fire. That's the wrath, which is the climax to the wrath of God. That's the wrath you're not appointed for. Well, can you prove that, brother? Yes, I can. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we're not appointed to wrath? Well, all you had to do was go a few inches to the right. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8 tells you the wrath that we're not appointed for. It's the wrath of the fiery furnace. The furnace of fire, it's a plague, it's a curse, it's the wrath of the Lamb, the climax to the wrath of God. Where else? Uh, Matthew 13, verses 42 and 50. Second uh, Peter 3, verses 10 through 12. Uh, Zechariah 14, 12. This is all about the furnace of fire. And every single chapter in the Bible that I'm mentioning in this series is also telling you all about the wrath of the Lamb on Judgment Day. That's what you're being raptured from. Pre-tribbers had it half right. Post-tribbers had it half right. The truth was somewhere in the middle. It is a catching up. It's a snatching away. When the uh, Jesus sends the angels forth to gather of the elect, it is a rapture. It's a rescuing. It sure is. Okay? But it does not occur until... The last day of the age, the seventh bowl judge, the wrath of God. Excuse me, the wrath of the Lamb, the climax to the wrath of God. And we're also learning in this series that Father is reigning during the millennium. His spirit is in the glorified body of Jesus. But it's correct to say, Lord God, omnipotent reigns. You're told that in Revelation 19 to start the millennium. Hallelujah. We're also learning in this series that you fight. You, the bride, fights. Oh, you mean Israel fights. No, you, the church, fight on your wedding day. You don't believe me? You want to see it in Father's Word? Of course you do. Well, I'm showing you in every single one of these lessons. Each lesson is a different chapter in Father's Word that tells you when the rapture is, what's the wrath of the Lamb that we're not appointed for, it's all in this series. Why not study Father's Word with me? I'm showing you all the verses, all the chapters. Do I, is some of my understanding a little off? It could be. Could be. Let's talk about it. 
Let, let's study together. But I think you're going to absolutely love this series again. Uh, today, in Lesson 6, we're going to be in Malachi 4. Lesson 5, we were in Malachi 3. And we've done Revelation 16, Isaiah 24, Revelation 19. All right. We'll see where we'll go next. But here in Lesson 6, we're in Malachi 4. We find out in Malachi 3 that answered just about all of those questions that the wording matched Zechariah 9. That's why I went to Malachi 3 next. Led there by the Holy Spirit. So Malachi 4 is also very interesting. It continues on with more information about what we need to know. Remember what we learned in Malachi 3. The rapture is in Malachi 3. Father the Lord here is telling us in Malachi 3, or he told us, um, who's getting raptured and who's not? Who do I want to spend eternity with and who I don't? We learned that faith wasn't enough by itself. All right? It's And who he will spare. Verse 17 in Malachi 3 is the rapture. Matches Zechariah 9. Now we're in Malachi 4. Let's see what else we learn about the seventh bowl, return of Christ, judgment day, wrath of the Lamb, the wrath that we are not appointed for, our wedding day, our rapture, and do we fight? Do we fight on our wedding day? All of those questions are answered in this series. Malachi 4. Oh, and one other thing that makes this chapter in the Bible worth paying special attention to, we learn about... Elijah and Moses, the two witnesses, coming before the day of the Lord starts, and they're given a mission. Has anyone ever told you that? They don't come when the day of the Lord starts at the sixth seal, when the king of the north, Islamic Caliphate army, defeats Egypt and the confederation of nations from the continent of Africa and heads south and passes through the mountains of Israel and to start the sixth seal. All right. Elijah and Moses don't come then. They come before the day of the Lord. And we've learned by putting all the how long countdowns together and all the prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah, we learn when they come. They come when the blasphemies are spoken. We see that in Revelation. When the blasphemies are spoken, they start their 1260 day countdown. Well, that sounds right, brother. Yeah, but do you know when that 1260-day period ends? Oh, it ends with the return of Christ. No, it does not, brothers and sisters. It ends with the seventh trumpet, which is day, day 1290 following the abomination of desolation. So guess what that tells you? The blasphemies are spoken 30 days after the abomination of desolation. The 1290 takes you to the seventh trumpet, the 1260-day uh, countdown that starts with the blasphemies 30 days after the abomination of desolation also counts down to the seventh trumpet. But is that the return of the Lord? Judgment Day, Wrath of the Lamb? No, it is not. Well, how do you know that, brother and sister? I mean, by, how do you know that, brother? By Daniel 12. From the abomination of desolation to the seventh trumpet is 1290. But Daniel had to keep waiting he will not rise to inheritance until 45 days later. What's that? The seventh bowl, battle of Armageddon, judgment day, the return of your groom. When God Almighty Spirit returns to earth in the physical realm, in the glorified body of Jesus Christ. All that information has been there the whole time, brothers and sisters. Check out my keep and share link. Keep and share website link. You'll find my Excel spreadsheet timeline. It's much better than, than my video, YouTube video, that looks like a timeline Excel spreadsheet chart. All right. I made some corrections since I did that months ago. I think, think I've got it down now. Who knows? Only Father knows. I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll learn a lot. Check it out. Now, when you click on that Keep and Share link and you see my Excel spreadsheet timeline of the 70th week of Daniel, not just the second half day of the Lord, Go to the far right of that same spreadsheet and you'll see a simplified timeline. When you go to the simplified timeline, that'll really help you lock in all the how long countdowns and all the prophecies that, we're, that we can use to help really make our timeline detailed. One example is Isaiah 20, referring to the last days. 
70th week of Daniel battle at the great river Euphrates where the king of the north and the king of the south battle for the final time during the middle of the fifth seal and Egypt and Ethiopia have to walk naked and barefoot as slaves and have to either serve as a slave army for the Islamic Caliphate that's turning into a beast or they have to be slave labor just like Israel is going to be slave labor for Babylon and build up Baghdad, the capital city, the great city. All right. If you don't think it's Baghdad, you need to see all my other lessons. All right. Revelation 18:21 matches Jeremiah 51:62 through 64, and it listeth the river that passes through the last days Babylon, the great city. So it's been there the whole time, brothers and sisters. Uh, here we go, Malachi 4, verse 1, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Every time you see something about the day, is he talking about, his father, talking about the entire day of the Lord, period, 945 days from the sixth seal to the seventh bowl, or is the day referring to the day that's the climax to the day of the Lord, the return of Christ at the seventh bowl, battle of the great day of God Almighty, judgment day. Well, when it says that day is coming, burning like an oven, he's referring to the final day, the wrath of the Lamb, the climax to the wrath of God. Oh, while I'm thinking about it, I don't want to finish this lesson and forget. If you ever wonder why Isaiah 2 seems to match Revelation 6, it does match, because that's Isaiah 2 is referring to the start of the day of the Lord. But it talks about Jesus' power or, or it talks about our Lord's power and majesty all right and presence surely that's when the world can see Jesus face to face returning isn't it no it's not that's the invisible presence of Almighty God during the day of the Lord he's orchestrating the day of the Lord he's orchestrating all the events the whirlwinds of the Lord he's acting as a shelter to his people who flee from the wicked you're gonna be here church for the entire 70th week of Daniel. You don't get raptured until it's time to enact the curse of the burning like an oven. The wrath of the Lamb, the plague of the furnace of fire. I gave you the key verses already. Here we go. All the proud, yes, all who do will be, will be on that day. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Again, this is talking about the climax to the day of the Lord says the Lord of hosts that will leave them neither root nor branch but to you who fear my name the son of righteousness Jesus Christ all Lord of, uh, of the elect one ruler of Israel Jesus shall arise that's the Jesus coming back to earth in the physical realm in his glorified body the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings there you go. You know what that healing is? It's your reward. Oh, yeah, this is Judgment Day. I get my reward. What is it? A fancy crown? A couple jewels? A new badge to put on my robe? No, your healing, your reward is your resurrection from the dead. Well, what if I'm still alive? It's your glorification in the twinkling of an eye. That's your reward. That's your healing. The healing in his wings also matches Hosea 6.2. You might want to make yourself a little footnote. Well, why do you bring up Hosea 6.2 with healing in his wings? Because the Lord, Father, wrote the entire Bible. Did you know that? He did, before the foundations of the world. Hallelujah. The healing in the wings of Hosea 6.2, Father says, I'm going to send my son back in 2,000 years after he ascended. He'll be back. He's coming back in 2,000 years with healing in his wings and to bind up your wounds. Aw, oh, come on, brother. Hosea 6.2 doesn't say that. Check it out. Check it out, brothers and sisters. We're getting close. 2,000 years from the date he ascended. When did he ascend? Nobody knows. If we did, we might be able to say the day and the hour. But because nobody knows the exact year even for sure when Jesus ascended, don't assume it's A.D. 33 because you'd be wrong. Well, how do you know that, brother? King Herod the first, he died, what, 4 BC, we believe, but we're not even sure about that. 
BC, well, guess what? Jesus was born before King Herod died. So we don't know the year Jesus ascended. But if we did, Hosea 6-2 may, may be telling us the year that Jesus will descend just like he arose. Thought I'd throw that out there. Pay attention when you read about the healing and the binding up of the wounds. That's talking about the resurrection, the glorification. All right, your wedding day. You get resurrected on your wedding day. If you think, if you're one of those Christians in the majority that think the church is separate sometimes during the 70th week of Daniel scriptures from Israel, then all I can say to you, brother, is go back and read Galatians 3. You need to read all Galatians, all the Romans, all the Hebrews, but... Go back and read Galatians 3 just to start, and you will find out that those in Christ, the bride, the church, the church is the sons of Abraham. Well, that kind of makes sense. It does make sense. Read Galatians 3. You are Zion. You, the bride, the church is Zion. You are the daughters of Zion. You are the daughters of Jerusalem. You are the men of Israel. Whoa, brother, whoa now. Don't confuse us with Israel. <laughs> You're not getting it, brothers and sisters. You are Zion. You are of the seed, capital S. Everyone in the seed, which is Christ, are the sons and daughters of Abraham through faith. There's only one harvest of that olive tree and fig tree and grapevine. There's only one. You must endure to the end. Hold fast. Keep your garments. Well, when's the end? Seventh bowl? Yeah, for those alive. When's the end for those who die? <laughs> when you die? Did you endure to the end with the temple of God in you? Did you glow so angels can pick you up and take you to heaven? Mm. Well, who does Jesus return with? Those souls of those who, who are in Christ? Well, I thought all the saints return with Jesus. No, brothers and sisters, that's not what the Bible means. Not from the third heaven. You join him at the meet in the air of the first heaven, the sky, not the second heaven universe, darkness, space, not the third heaven, the throne room of God. You're seen coming down to terra firma from high altitudes where the meet took place. Again, if you believe in a pre-trib rapture separate from Israel, First of all, that tells me you do not have a clue what Galatians 3 means. I don't mean to hurt your feeling, brothers and sisters. Go back and read it. You are the bride of Christ, the daughters of Zion. Wedding, that boy from Nazareth. And by the way, you do fight that night. I hope you're watching this entire series. You will be turned into a threshing sledge. Father will do the treading and the trampling. You will do the threshing, and Father will also do the consuming. He's got Iran's nukes. He's got the uh, fire and brimstone blowing from his nostrils. He's got lava shooting up from the cracked earth. He's got lightning, which will consume you on the spot. He, th he tramples with his hailstones the size of concrete cinder blocks and boulders rolling down the mountains, not to mention our fighting platform called the White Horse, which is explained throughout Scripture as the chariots of Israel and chariots of fire. Well, if it's a chariot of Israel mode of transportation, what am I, the bride member, doing on it? Again, you're not getting it, brothers and sisters. You are true Israel. You are Zion. You are the sons of Abraham. Until you get that, you'll never understand the rapture. But if you've, if you've uh, watched, if you've studied with me the last five lessons, you've already seen that you are raptured at the seventh bowl judgment day. But does the entire planet get burned up? the entire atmosphere get burned up on this day and we have to go find a new planet for the millennium or the millennium takes place in the spiritual realm no 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 how do you know that well if you just studied lesson two with me you just saw in isaiah 24 which primarily talks about the bowls of wrath and then also the climax wrath of the lamb return of christ you would have saw that few men are left so there are people to repopulate the earth during the millennium, left alive. The entire planet is not burned up. We may eventually go to a new heaven, new earth, but not till after the great white throne judgment. I know I'm throwing a lot at you, brothers and sisters. Hopefully you saw my other five lessons. If not, this is all new to you. Study with me, brothers.
I'm proving it to you using Father's Word. We left off at the end of verse 2 with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked. Who's the you, brothers and sisters? Is it God? Is it Lord God? Uh, ancient of days, Lord of hosts, is the you um, the Son of God, Son of Righteousness, Jesus, when he arises? No, it's the bride of Christ, the sons of Abraham, true Israel, Zion, daughters of um, Jerusalem, daughters of Zion. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Well, how do you know they're not? These passages aren't talking about Jesus. Doesn't he tread the winepress alone in Revelation 19? How do you know this is talking about the bride? Because the your is not capitalized right there. Well, the you was, yeah, because it started the sentence. Your feet. He's talking about you. You. When Jesus arises, you arise, Ezekiel 37. And again, it's talking about the church. You shall trample the wicked. Every one of these lessons is proving to you throughout the Old and New Testament that you fight on your wedding day. Fine linen, clean and bright. The bride has made herself ready. You are an army. We saw in Zechariah 9 that the bride, the church, his robes are dipped in blood. You're so soaked with blood this night that it looks like you've been drinking wine all night long. Revelation 19 tells you that your groom's robe is dipped in blood. Zechariah 9 tells you that your fine linen, clean and bright starts out that way up on the storm cloud when, when the meat takes place with your groom. And then by the end of this night, by morning, you're soaked in blood. Because you trample. And we, and we learn through many other scriptures that you also thresh. So if I say you just thresh, that's not necessarily correct. You also help trample. Now, is it your chariot of Israel, your white horse, that's doing the trampling? Could be. Or maybe you're just walking on the dead bodies. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Well, Jesus kills them, and then we just walk across the ashes of their burned bodies. Well, maybe, but you're a threshing killing machine. This I know. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant. Here we go, brothers and sisters. The entire Old Testament ends with these last three verses, 4, 5, and 6. I need you to put your thinking caps on. You're about to learn who the two witnesses are. Oh, just one of the witnesses are mentioned here. All right, let's see what verse 4 says. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Brothers and sisters, Father is using the law of Moses, which was commanded to him that includes the statutes and judgments, statutes and judgments, I hope you're listening. He's using this to accuse Israel at the final judging of Israel. He's using it to accuse them. They did not keep it. Therefore, they better be in Christ. Well, what happens, brother, if somebody who lived a thousand years before Jesus came to earth died? Is it possible that they were saved? Some of them? Yes. Yes, yes. If the temple of Almighty God was inside of them when they died, then they will be resurrected, even though they died years and years and years before Jesus ever gave the sacrifice. Well, how can that be, brother, you might ask? They didn't keep the, uh, the law. They, del the Lord delighted in them enough that he chose them to spend eternity with him. It's Father, the final vine dresser. It's his decision. If they were, and remember, if they never heard about Jesus and they never rejected him, Father made a way that he can keep some of them for eternity. 
if they if he delighted in them and he father wants to be around them for eternity father fi finds a way of doing it even though they did not live perfectly he gets to choose who spends eternity with him now on the other hand though if you are a Jew uh, and you know a small s seed of Jacob if you will and you've been told the truth about Jesus and heard the gospel of Jesus and you reject it now that's a whole different story Jesus is the only way but if you had never heard the gospel of Christ and you never rejected it then father made you another way if does father delight in you did father delight in you then he may choose you to be part of the family of God that's father's choice but Moses will be one of the two witnesses. Well, brother, you're going to have to show me a verse besides this Malachi 4.4 to prove to me that Moses is one of the two witnesses. Fine. Go to Zechariah 4.14. I think it's the last verse in Zechariah 4. The anointed ones, the two anointed ones, stand beside the Lord. Now take that Zechariah 4.14. Walk you a little behind. I'm sorry. Over to the Transfiguration chapters. Who's standing beside the Lord when he gets glorified in the vision? The two witnesses who are Moses and Elijah. Don't fight it, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Before I say again. Before I say again. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. When is the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord? At the sixth seal, when the sun and moon go dark. And the entire planet, regardless of whether you're Hindu, you're Buddhist, you're atheist, you're Muslim, you're Christian, whatever. It doesn't matter what your religion is. That come the sixth seal, the entire planet will go, whoa, the creator of the universe is real and he's here. Because the hair is standing up on my arms. I'm seeing signs that NASA can't explain. The whole earth is shaking and quaking and rocking and rolling. The whole world, something is going on. It's called the invisible presence. All right, Isaiah 19, Father will ride on the dark clouds. All right, of the whirlwinds of the Lord throughout the day of the Lord, everyone will know, but they won't know which God it is. They'll assume that it's their God. We know which God it is, but it's his invisible presence. That's why Isaiah 2 matches Revelation 6. Mid-trip pre-wrath believers. Your Lord does not appear until the seventh bowl. You do not rise to your inheritance if you're dead until he appears. If you're living, you don't go. you got to wait on the resurrection of the dead. Well, the Lord comes in phases, my brother. Uh, no, he doesn't. That's you trying to make things fit. Because you're determined you don't want to be here during the 70th week. I don't want to be here either. But we're here, brothers. You got a mission. Read Revelation 12, 11. Read Revelation 6, 11. You're here, brother. Read Galatians 3. <laughs> you don't raise from the dead until seed of Jacob, small s, raises from the dead. But guess what? If they raise from the dead, that means they are the family of God. They are in Christ. Well, what if they died before Christ was ever born? How can they be in Christ? Because of what Galatians 3 tells you about the promise. Alright? Only the only people who can raise from the dead when Jesus arises, the Son of Righteousness, in verse 2, anyone who Father delights in, and Father had his temple in you, he sojourned with you before you died, the sons of Abraham are those who are in the seed, capital S, who is Christ. So if you died and the temple of God was in you, and this happened before you ever heard about the gospel of Christ, Father says, no, nope, this one's with me. Even though you never heard the gospel of Christ, he'll train you, he'll teach you, but you were in Christ. Well, maybe that's only for the seed of Jacob who were around before Jesus. Well, maybe, but I'm not so sure those people on the other side of the planet who live righteous but never heard 
God's plan, never heard the Old Testament, never heard the gospel of Christ, I'm not going to say that he can't choose them for eternity, but if he does, they're considered in Christ, though they never accepted Christ. Whoa, brother, now you're teaching false doctrine. Go back and read Galatians 3. If Father chooses to raise you up on the same day that he raises his son up, because he delights in you, and his temple was in you, and he sojourned with you when you died, you're considered in Christ. And can, you're considered a son of Abraham. So all those billions of people that you like to think never have a chance because they never heard the gospel of Christ, because they were alive, before, let's say, a thousand, two thousand years before Christ ever came to earth and they weren't Jewish and just sucks to be them all them billions of people just died they just they're um, destined for hell are you sure go back and read Galatians 3 if father thinks you're a keeper you're considered in Christ whether you never heard the gospel or not you're considered a son of Abraham a son uh, you have the faith you have the faith you have the same faith in God as Abraham as Mary as Sarah God can choose who he wants to spend eternity with Father. now maybe he didn't choose any of them but he can he can all right that's getting pretty deep and kind of getting off subject a little bit all right to finish the Old Testament here we go I will send Elijah before the coming and great dreadful day of the Lord. And we know from the how long countdowns, the timeline, check it out. If I'm right, and I think I am, he's going to be here. They are going to be here 360 days before the start of the day of the Lord at the sixth seal. 360 days, brothers and sisters. The entire length of time of the fifth seal is 390 days. That's the Isaiah 32 prophecy. The year and some days after the midnight cry is heard, um, when the Antichrist goes in the temple the first time, Daniel 11:29 through 35, and he claims to be the Mahdi and the Messiah, and he starts rounding up all the Christians, along with the Israeli prophets who are helping him, round up all the Christians and torturing them and scourging them and try to get them to renounce Christ and they're burning all the holy Bibles. This is the midnight cry, brothers and sisters, to start the fifth seal. The abomination and desolation, the stopping of the sacrifices, that's the fifth seal. You see it right there in Daniel 11, 29 through 35. That's the first 30 days of the fifth seal. And then, verses 36 through 40 of Daniel 11 is the remainder of the fifth seal. And the tail end of verse 40, when the Antichrist army heads south, passes through the mountains of Israel, passes through, key phrase, that starts the sixth seal. So how many days is between verse 29 through verse 40? 390. That's the year and some days prophecy of Isaiah 32. From the time they start rounding up the first Christians, probably at midnight, until Father brings the curse of the day of the Lord, which climax is the curse of the plague of fire at the seventh bold judgment day. Don't get confused. It's 390 days. A year and some days, I'm coming back. And when I come back, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to blow the first four trumpets. And now the, the Israeli prophets who rounded up all those Christians and killed a lot of them, guess what? They're going to drink wormwood and gall. That's the year of their punishment. You see that in the book of Jeremiah. The year, excuse me, the year of their punishment. First four trumpets. Then after that, they're followed by the last three woes. So, when Elijah and Moses show up at the blasphemies of Daniel 11, verse 36, which is 30 days after the fifth seal has started, that starts the 1260 countdown from the blasphemies. Because the Antichrist went back in the temple at verse 36 and now proclaims to be the God of gods and sits in the temple acting as God. 
And then he begins to act against the strongest fortresses, and you have the final battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, Egypt. And then, at the sixth seal, the king of the north starts heading south to take plunder. That starts the sixth seal, verse, the end of verse 40 in Daniel 11. See my timeline, brothers and sisters. I think you'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot from it. Don't bet the farm on it, but I think I'm pretty close. I might actually have it. Check it out. It'll be a blessing to you. Not costing you anything. Nothing for sale here. Nothing. Don't even accept donations. I just love studying Father's Word every day. Hope you'll study with me. There's your two witnesses coming one trip around the sun before the sixth seal. Now, what does that mean? Coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Why is he bringing them 360 days before the start of the day of the Lord? Well, here's why. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. This is the last verse of the entire Old Testament. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So you've got the curse of the day of the Lord, trumpets and six bowls. Then you've got the curse, judgment day, burning like an oven on the last day. That's the wrath of the Lamb, the plague of the furnace of fire. It's time to burn the tares and all the wicked and all the rebels and all the perjurers must be purged from the kingdom so we can start the millennium. But pay attention to what this says in verses 4, 5, and 6. These two witnesses are going to have 360 days to turn the hearts of fathers to the children, the hearts of children to their fathers. Israel's going to have to accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth, bow a knee to him. If not, the day of the Lord will begin on schedule at the sixth seal. If they relent, fa uh, they repent, Father will relent. Father, you no one can tell Father you didn't give us one last chance. That's why the two witnesses are coming 360 days before the sixth seal begins. Before the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, and there's a little footnote right here at the last verse, Zechariah 14, 12. That is one of those verses I gave you, brothers and sisters, that explains the wrath of the Lamb, judgment day, curse of the furnace of fire. Remember, I gave you Matthew 13, 2 Peter 3. Um... 2 Thessalonians 1 and Zechariah 14, 12. It's right there. Yes, nukes are used that night. Brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson, lesson number six in this series, has been a blessing to you. Again, you learn about the rapture. You learn about the two witnesses. You've learned about the bride fighting. Fighting? Oh, we're just walking on the dead bodies. We're not fighting. We'll see all these other lessons in this series brothers and sisters if you're still not sure so what did we find out the truth is somewhere in the middle pre-tribbers were wrong post-tribbers were wrong mid-trib was definitely wrong but they were right about the invisible presence of the Lord is here they're right about that but when is the rapture and it is a rapture post-tribbers all right and can't let you off the hook it is a snatching up catching away it's the rapture of the seventh bowl when the Son of Righteousness shall arise, that's the resurrection of the dead. It has to happen before the living is glorified. Daniel 12 tells you it's exactly 1,335 days following the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem. Well, I didn't think we're supposed to know the day or the hour. Well, you won't until, what does Daniel 8 say? It says, when the first seal is loosed. Where's that at? Daniel 8 is uh, Daniel 8 uh, verses 23 through 25 is the explanation by Gabriel of the vision. The 2,300 day prophecy. The shall arise of that king matches the shall rise of the vile one in a, Daniel 11 verse 21 matches Daniel 8 23 through 25. That's your first seal of the book of Revelation. That king that comes in peaceably, and he shall um, take over the kingdom by intrigue. He shall arise. There's the key phrase you see it in Daniel 8.23. A king shall arise. That's him. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, tells you exactly what city the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, is coming from. 
It's Nineveh, Mosul, Iraq. Al Baghdadi today is from Mosul, Iraq. Well, he got crowned in Mosul, Iraq. Is he the Antichrist of the 70th week of Daniel? I don't believe so. Why do you say that, brothers and sisters, if he's if he got crowned in Mosul? Well, first of all, because if, when you look at Daniel 11's battle by battle, waypoint by waypoint, during the second 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 11 verses 13 and 14 and 15 is how the 70th week is going to start. And the first seal is loosed at Daniel 11 21. Well, we haven't gone through verses 13 through 20 yet. So how can al-Baghdadi have been the one and crowned, uh, in which he was crowned July 4th of 2014? So before he was crowned, I don't believe we went through verses Daniel 11, 13 through 20, nor at this point we should have been at the second or third seal by now. I don't believe that any of that has happened. So he's probably not the one, but he may be the one mentioned in Daniel 13, 14, and 15, he may be that one. But the vile one of Daniel 11, 21 is two Islamic State leaders later. So he may be the one of Daniel 11, 13, and 14, and 15, and those things might be getting ready to happen. Read verse, uh, verses 13 through 20. But two leaders later, we get to the leader of the Islamic State of verse 21 he will also be from Nineveh Mosul Iraq but he will be different he'll have fierce features he will understand center sinister schemes maybe he's gonna will and deal with Putin and Donald Trump I have no idea but quit saying the Vatican and the Pope is the Antichrist now maybe he's the false prophet maybe he's involved somehow I've been I'm pretty sure Russia's involved somehow but be careful. Nahum 1, Father warns you, the vile one comes from the vile city Nineveh. Mosul, Iraq. Here's another extra bonus. Who's the ten kings? Oh, the ten kings are probably nations like Russia and Iran and all that. Oh, really? What does the Bible tell you? These kings don't, these ten kings, these ten horns, do not have a kingdom. Well, then maybe it's not them. It's not. It's not nations. It's organizations. In other words, it's people. These ten kings rule hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, but they're not in charge of a nation or a kingdom. What do you mean, brother? Have you ever heard of ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, Taliban, uh, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, Lakshari Taba out of India? Are you catching on? When the Antichrist body is possessed by Satan at the fifth seal, and he starts working miracles, oh, they're going to get their kingdom. And all these uh, military defeats of the governments of Saudi Arabia and Jordan and, and Iraq and Baghdad and, and Lebanon, all of these, uh, in Egypt, all of these military defeats happen. Those ten kings that don't have a kingdom yet are going to get their kingdom. Something to think about, brothers and sisters. I hope this lesson's been a blessing to you. I can't wait to see you in the next uh, lesson of the series. This was Malachi 4, lesson number 6. Can't wait to see you next time. God bless.